All right, so for this webinar, I just want to give a little intro. So this is with Will Schroeder, one of my good friends. He's actually acquired seven venture back startups, and he has been through it all. He's built companies, he's sold companies, he's had companies fail. He currently runs startups.com. And in this podcast, what we go over is what to do if you feel like you're stuck, what to do if you feel like you're burnt out, you can't go any further, maybe the business is stalled in growth, but you've raised a little bit of money from investors. Maybe you've raised a lot. And so we go over a few buckets where maybe you're sitting on a good amount of runway, maybe it's eight, 12 months. So you have a lot of options in terms of making it a potentially a, a life changing acquisition for you, but there's decisions you have to make now. And then we also talk about a different bucket where maybe you raised a ton of money and there's no product market fit you raised in 2021, 2022, and you're just thinking, what do I do? And so that's another bucket. And then another one is I'm running out of money. And I have to sell this business, but I want to take care of my team. I want to show some sort of return to investors. Um, I just want out. So I've been having a lot of these conversations. So I thought it'd be great to bring Will on the podcast and get his perspective. And more than anything, if you're in any of these buckets, I just want to say you've built a great company, you've built a great product, you have customers, you have optionality when at times it may feel like you don't. So I hope you enjoy the listen and I hope you uh, get through whatever you're going through, if it's a hard time or a good time and uh, really start thinking about the importance of preparation when getting acquired and ideally not getting down to one month of runway to go to market. But we talk about every single one of those scenarios. So listen up and uh, I call Will Startup Yoda. So um, hope you enjoy. Cheers. All right. I'm here with Will Schroeder, the founder of Startups.com, who is a good friend of mine, the man, the myth, the legend. How you doing, Will? What's going on, buddy? It's, good to, be here. it's good to chat. The last podcast we did was candidly one of my favorites, so I'm glad to have you back on here. But um, we got a different topic today. We're going to be talking about uh, how to acquire venture back startups. And I guess to kick things off, do you want to give people just a quick introduction of yourself that may not know you? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. So uh, I've been doing the startup thing for a very long time. <laughs> uh, not kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like thirty <laughs> years. Yeah, it's it's been a long, long, long time. Uh, and I've done nine startups. You know, this is all I've ever done for three decades, nonstop. A few startups at the same time in parallel. Wouldn't recommend. And so in that time. I've basically gotten to live all of these lives, right? Not just through all my own startups, but I've helped thousands and thousands of other founders. You know, guys, you remember, that's how you and I met. You know, you were getting launched with- Hey, let us let me give you a, a shout out on this. So when I first launched um, my group, Far now obviously Far.com, you reached out to me on like day two of launch, just yep. to say, what's up? Give me some words of encouragement. And that meant a lot to me. Like it really yeah, of course, did, man. I, and I, I don't think twice about it. Cause I'm like, I didn't know you from Adam and right. And I was just like, Hey, here's a guy with a cool idea. Maybe he needs some help. Right. And you know, we ended up becoming good friends from that. And so, uh, but it happens all the time, right. You know, where, where I reach out to a founder and I'm like, Hey, I think you need help. And honestly, guys, a lot of times w when I reach out, um, it's cause I think they're doing shitty. And not in your case. I'm saying that, like, you know, but <laughs> is no, that no, but, really you know, why? <laughs> <laughs> now I finally know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Like, but you know, I, I'll hear about a founder that's like, um, you know, the, the business uh, ran out of money or something like that, and I'm like, hey, there aren't a lot of people that are willing to reach out and help, right? It's easy to say, hey, they just raised a ton of money. Let me reach out and tell them how I want to get on their bandwagon. You know, the the, the real friends show up when they're the only person texting you saying, hey, dude, you need some help. And uh, and and I'm I'm always down to do that. That that truly meant a lot to me. Um, and just getting to know you over the years, I always text you for you're like I call you startup Yoda, like. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you always, you know, help me through, you know, whatever I'm, I'm, I'm going through. Um, but hopefully this doesn't turn into everybody hitting you up now. Yeah, um, that's okay. okay. So, that's but the topic, um, you know, we really want to dive into is, uh, there's a lot of venture back startups out there, um, yeah. with founders that, you know, may have lost motivation, their optionality in terms of upside liquidity is not looking great. And people are looking to buy these companies and there's founders right. looking to exit these companies. 
Right. And I thought this would be a great podcast um, to go over because you bought how many venture back businesses have you bought? Six. Wow. Six. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to just start with like, I, now I'm thinking, how did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, let me start with explaining to you how I understood that they could be bought because this was, you know, b before the days of acquire.com <laughs> in the olden days. Right. <laughs> and, and so uh, l let me rewind back because guys, I think you can appreciate this having been through the self and now being, you know, with the venture backed startup here. Um, one of the first startups that I was uh, running that was venture backed uh, was back in the mid two thousands called affordit.com. It allowed you to buy stuff using weekly payment, literally exactly what a firm in Klarna and all those guys do now. We were like a decade before those guys. Sometimes too late, sometimes too early. We were too early. Doesn't matter. And this was one of the first times that I had been um, in a position where I'd raised money and run out of it. Didn't know what to do, right? And so I did like what most founders do when I ran myself into the ground. I was just like, no, this thing cannot fail. And let my ego get in front of it and just did everything wrong. At some point though, we actually ran out of money, right? Like there, there was nothing else we could do. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I get it. We're out of money, but like, like literally what happens to this thing now that it's out of cash, right? Uh, well, it turns out, and again, a lot of folks don't know this, and this is like the premise of everything we're going to talk about. But when a startup runs out of cash, everybody kind of runs for the hills. The founders are like in a broken cap table where they have no upside. So like, hey, I'm out of here. The investor is like, well, hey, there's no one to run it and there's no money. So we're out of here. And all of a sudden this great asset often is just sitting there. And no one can do anything with it. And that kind of, I just kind of put that, I'm like, huh, this seems to happen a lot. And then most of my friends are founders. So I would listen to them go through these incredible stories of building these great businesses. And then they ran out of money or it wasn't venture fundable and, you know, anymore. And then these assets would just sit there. So after a while, I'm like, who's, who's buying all of these? Like, like what happens to all these assets, especially when they're worth a lot? And it turns out nobody. So, so at, at the, the the early stages of startups.com, this was like 10, 12 years ago, I knew that I wanted to build this platform to help startup. I knew there's lots of things that I wanted to do within that, like around, like building a customer acquisition app, building a funding app, all these things. And I'm like, I can't build all these at once, but what if I could buy them? So I moved to San Francisco um, and I was in like 12 meetings a day talking to every single startup founder that would listen to me saying, look, if you have something that's in our space, like in the startup space, we'd love to talk to you. We end up talking to and doing diligence on over a hundred different venture funded startups to buy. And we end up pulling the trigger on six of which all six completed. So that was the genesis of me getting into the buy side, which was trying to buy companies that fit the thesis for what startups.com did. So in terms of the companies that you acquired, what made them stand out out of the hundred? Was it yeah the motivation of the founder was it the deal structure that you were able to obtain was it like what what really because i think a, a situation that a lot of founders are in today is they get a lot of cash on hand you know from 2021 2022 yep. they're not really growing too fat but they're not like in a dire need to sell but they know they have an outsized valuation that they're probably never going to grow into Yep. And so they're not that motivated to really grow the business, but there's, you know, it's probably better than a job, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so in these situations, um, you know, how do you, how do you think through that? I guess in terms of, you know, if you're a buyer, how do you create a win-win deal for these venture back businesses that have, you know, they built a great product, they have product market fit, they have tons of happy customers, they yep. have an amazing team. Uh, how does that, like, what do you do? Here's what I did. And, and I don't think this approach is for everyone, but it was kind of syncs with, with how I operate. I sat down with the founder and, and I said, look, I may or may not buy your business. Who the hell knows how, how these things go? And there's a million you know, variables. I said, but let me explain to you how this process works. So whether you sell to me or someone else that you're taken care of, because as you know, all I care about are founders. So like, you know, I was basically saying, here's how to talk to your investors. Here's how to talk to your staff. Here's how to talk to everyone else. And here's what to expect for yourself, right? Again, most people aren't going to have that kind of advice because they're just trying to buy a business. They're not trying to advise a founder. But I use that to say, look, again, I don't care if you buy from me or not, or sell to me or not, rather. Um, but I care that if you're going to exit this thing, that you do it right. So most of those conversations, guys, were just me um, having a conversation with a founder to help them out, right? Now, in some of those uh, conversations, the founder was in a tough spot. Here were the cat founder typically was, right? One was they just ran out of money, right? There is no money in the bank. And the thing is going to wind down. That's always a category, obviously, right? Now, when that happens, I think something that a lot of people just don't understand is that there's no one at the wheel anymore, right? Like there's there's no one. It's, it's not like, um, oh, hey, we've run out of money. 
and yet we have a full-time staff running this thing. It's like at some point, everyone just drops the keys and walks away, particularly investors. The reason I say that is because in those cases, the value goes to zero. And I think even the founder doesn't realize that. Usually the founders are like, well, I just raised that a $20 million valuation. And I'm like, yeah. And if you stop working there, the value is now zero. <laughs> there there's no value and most founders don't get that does that make sense it, it does and there's i think there if you've been following kind of like the data that's been coming out like there's probably i think i read i can't remember who put the report out um it was either um carta or pilot and they were there's a stat saying like 60 percent or 70 percent of venture back startups have like 12 months of runway left. I'd be so shocked if it's, yeah, yeah, even that much anymore. Yeah. Like, so given the last 12 to 18 months. So we kind of have these two interesting buckets that I think people are looking at. And we've been seeing a lot of interest on acquire.com in terms of both on, on, you know, founders just saying, hey, you know, this isn't going to work out for me. And then the other side, and I'm, I'm referring to, I got cash in the bank, you know, we yeah. could go for a decade, but, you know, it probably makes sense to just kind of, you know, wind this one down or just sell right. the assets and go build something new. But, and then the that other was my second category. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. And the second bucket is the one that um, you're referring to, which is we're running out of money. We yep. have to sell. And or sometimes it doesn't even come into their head. It's just, you know, we're running out of money. The startup is failing and yep. they don't ever think like, hey, you've actually built, again, a great product you know, happy customers, you've created value and, you know, getting those startups to have quote unquote, a soft landing and do a, a buyer like yourself or another, like that's, that's a topic that's been a rising trend. Um, so let me, let me play like a theoretical situation. So let's say there's, there's a founder out there that's in that situation. Sure. They're, they're losing money. Um, maybe they have eight months of runway. What should they start doing in terms of they, they want to sell the business. Yep. They want to have a soft landing, um, maybe return some capital back to investors. There's probably not going to be a lot of upside for the founder, or maybe there is. Um, how, like, What advice would you give to that founder? Well, the first bit of advice, and, and sadly, uh, guys, this, you know, you and I were talking over the weekend. Th this is This is more of the advice I'm giving right now because a lot of people are at the end of that runway, right? And my, my first bit of advice is you understand you'll probably get zero, right? And, and the reason I say that isn't isn't to be negative. It's just to prepare people. Because w w what happens is five seconds ago, you raised a bunch of money and you were at $20 million valuation, $100 million, valuation, w whatever you were at, right? And psychologically, it's just hard to understand that that could go from that to zero or some number close to it, right? Now, for most of the founders, they're like, I, I can't comprehend that because my whole life is in this. I told me all this money that it was worth something. And I'm like, all oh, that's awesome. It's great that you did that. And it's probably worth zero. Now, when I say that, zero sounds like such a finite number, right? It sounds like, well, how does it be exactly zero? I, I start with zero because I said, dude, the probability that you will find a buyer at the end of this is extraordinarily low, which is why I always then point them back to you guys, because you guys have you know be, begun to change that equation. But think of statistically probability, how many things have to fall in place for an exit to occur, right? First off, you have to have something people want, which isn't necessarily always the case, but let's assume you do. Second off, the people that you would take it to have to be in a position to buy, which everyone thinks, oh, you know, I've got this great asset. There must be a bunch of buyers. Not really, right? Which is where you guys come in because you guys open up so many more doors of people that wouldn't uh, normally be a, a case. I, I told three different founders this last week, giving the same advice. We're all in kind of a wind down venture funded situation. I said, here's three buckets that you're going to wind up in. Either private equity, which is only an option if you have revenue, right? The second is a strategic buyer, which is always your best case, but there aren't that many. And the likelihood that they're willing to buy in the contact you have has the authority or the wherewithal to champion the deal, fairly low. And then the third is essentially someone like me or you guys, like a one-off entrepreneur buyer that's buying it as uh, as their own acquisition, not part of something bigger, right? Those are typically your three options and you have to exhaust all. I agree. I, what, what's your thoughts on this? So this is kind of like the advice because I've been having a lot of these calls too. I imagine, yeah. And, you know, they're, they're painful because some are in dire situations, some in both buckets, like, Hey, I have a lot of like cash on hand, but you know, we're not growing and all my investors are yelling at me. And then also the, we're running out of money. And again, all my, I just want to move on. Everyone just yep. in these two situations, they understand. And just for, for listeners, when I say optionality, what I mean is that big exit that you dreamed of when you raised the money. 
you know, it's, it's gone. It's, right. it's very unlikely to happen. And Happy I just also, time. I also want to just um, mention, Will, and we both know this, but, and that's okay. Because statistically, when you like acquire.com, we're venture back. Statistically, to reach venture scale, you have a 0.01% chance of success. So right. you have to be a statistical outlier to succeed. So you're not a yep. failure. You haven't done anything wrong. It just, that's just how startups go. You win some, you lose some. And sometimes the, the advice I give is the number one thing you don't want to waste more than capital is, is your, your years of your life. Yeah, absolutely. It, if you see the writing on the wall, and as a founder, you usually can. You know, I know there's a lot of startup virtues, like, you know, just keep going, keep going. But if you're just drained mentally, um, you know, I think looking at a sale is is a great option because, again, you're able to get some sort of capital back to investors, possibly. But more importantly, I think restructuring the business to where it's a profitable business, where it's a more yep. sustainable business, you get off the venture track of high growth and you turn it into a business that's going to be around for a while. Yep. And you've and you've done that, Will. Um, we, we have, yeah. And, and I here's the challenge, though. Um from an investor standpoint, a lot of folks don't under don't understand kind of what some of the investor motivations are. And let's segment them as as two groups. And I think this is important for the buyers to understand as well. There's two groups of investors. There's angel investors, which are essentially people where if, if cash got returned to them, they would buy a cyber truck or something, right? You know, they, they would have a use for it. Right. And then there are venture investors who it doesn't matter if you return money to them. Not like not, you know, an insignificant amount of money. Right. In other words, if if you say, hey, um, who's your lead investor? Is it Bessemer? Bessemer. If, if you were to say, hey, Bessemer, um, here's eighty five thousand dollars. You know, thanks for your investment. Here's your return. They don't even know. Right. And again, a lot of people don't understand that. And when I say that Bessemer or folks like them would prefer to be able to have their stock just moved over to another entity that would likely do something with it and hopefully have an outcome down the road so they don't have to write it all down, right? And again, th 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 there's some nuances there that people don't understand, but have a tremendous amount of influence when it comes to selling. So let's talk about, let's talk about deal structures in yeah. terms of, um, I'd love to hear maybe one that you structured and, yeah. you know, ones that, you know, I'm, I'm currently recommending. And I think a big part of this, and tell me if you agree with this, a big part is preparation. I think a sure. big mistake that a lot of venture backed um, startups uh, do when they go to market to sell to buyers is it's a complete mess. And I always say the first thing a buyer is going to do is they're going to look at that and say, oh, I got to fix a bunch of this stuff. Yeah, well, and, no and that could be expenses problem. are too high. Um, you know, you haven't, you know, gotten to that, you know, sustainable path if you can get there. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah, makes it yeah. go ahead. So go ahead. Oh, here's what I would say. Um, You've got a few components when you're looking at buying a, a company, particularly a venture funded one, but but either way, but we'll use a venture funded one because it's just slightly more complex. So we'll cover you got a few components that you, you've got to consider. Number one, what happens to the founder uh, or founding team? Okay. Like not insignificant. Like, like I can't go buy a company and totally overlook what may or may not happen to the founder, right? Because that's kind of the person driving the deal. But let's put that aside. Okay. okay. That's one bucket. The second is who are the investors? Are they angels? Are they VCs? And what are their motivations? I, I can't state this enough. When I talked to founders, founders, I talked to you last weekend back. I said, who's on your board? Who makes the decisions? Why? Because that's what challenges are going to come in from trying to sell this thing. Because remember, you got to sell it internally before you sell it external. You know, you got to convince people that it can be sold or it should be sold. And in the personalities there absolutely matter. The third part is is this business even survivable, right? In other words, like if, if you were to say, hey, we've spent $7 million, we've built a product, but you know, it's not really, in, we don't have any revenue yet, et cetera. We just have a ton of expense. Who wants that, right? And please don't tell me it's because of the data, right? <laughs> Nobody wants your shit data, right? Like that's not really the way it works. Like, do you have something of value? Cool. What is it? And how do, how do you prove that it has value? You can't just sell the venture story to the world. Like nobody gives a shit. Do you have some revenue? People understand that. So, so those are three components that tend to like, like, uh, determine how I'm going to structure the deal to try to make sure each of those things uh, is considered. Gotcha. And so as a, as a founder, what can I expect when one of these transactions happen? Yep. Like, what am I getting? What is my benefit? Why should I even consider this? And assuming I'm a founder, I've, I'm I'm out of gas. Yep. My team is no longer believes it's it. The writing again is on the wall. 
Yeah. But you still have time. And I think the the worst scenarios that I, and I, I got an investor update the other day from um, a company I invested in, five weeks of runway left. Right. So, I mean, and you don't just wind up there. You did a million things to try to avoid that, but you do eventually wind up. So in terms of, let's say um, a typical scenario I'm seeing lately is we have a year of runway left. Right. And we're not hitting, you know, like we're not going to raise any more capital and just shout out to every venture back founder right now too, because of the whiplash that's happened over the last four years. I think it's very understandable. Just your valuation was here. And then yep. I was like, psych, no, it's down 90%. <laughs> and then it was like, but you got to grow at all costs. And then it's like, psych, no, you got to be probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we're back to psych. You got to grow at all costs, but it's got to be also like really capital efficient. Right, so right, it's just right. been sort of like a up and down. And a lot of founders are, you know, frankly, you know, burnt. And so I, let's just say, pretend I'm, you know, that founder in that situation. And I'm I'm just ready to move on. Yep. I got 12 months runway. I want to take care of my team. Um, You know, how should I start, you know, preparing for sale? How could I, like, what, what? What is the main benefit or outcome I should expect when I'm in that situation? Well, in most cases, whatever money you raised likely has a preference on it. So for those that aren't familiar, often when you, when you raise capital, uh, so you raise $10 million, just making up a number, um, there's a preference which indicates that if you sell, that money has to get paid back first. And then whatever's left over goes pro rata, meaning by percentage of what else is there. So in a lot of cases, by the time you get to this point, even if you've only raised a few million dollars, the likelihood that you're going to sell something and um, get over your your preference hurdle is usually pretty low, but that's okay. There's a part that people don't, uh, founders don't understand either. Why would you? Because you've never done this. Um, is that- I love it when you say that. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, I always caveat because people get all anxious. Like, oh, I don't know how to raise capital or I don't know how to sell a business. Like, that's why, why I call you, you startup Yoda. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, one of the things that, that I coach founders on when they go through this um, is I say, hey, you know that you can go back and uh, create a new deal for yourself within the company, right? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. And most founders don't know that. And don't get me wrong. On the one hand, it's the last thing investors want to hear, but kind of a fun fact, by the time you get there, investors knew this a long time ago. I mentioned that company that I did back in the mid 2000s called Afford It. By the time I was like, guys, you're not going to believe this. We're going to have to shut this down. They were like, dude, we wrote this off like a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> they were so far ahead of me. Like, like uh, they got it. And there's, don't keep me wrong. That's not there, every there, case. There's a saying in venture, your lemons ripe fast. Mm -hmm. Are they, yeah, you get it. But yeah. um, I want to, I want to um, uh, touch on that a little bit more because that sure. is an option for founders is you can go back to your investors and yes, they know. Yep. And they'll be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm glad it doesn't always work out, but I've seen it work out recently. I won't, I won't name companies, but you can go back to investors and this is bucket. Um, I'm using hand motions. I don't know if you're listening or watching the video, um, but let's say you have a lot of cash on hand. You can actually go back to investors and just say, Hey, you know, we raised a lot of cash. We want it you know, adjust this business to a profitable, sustainable business. And we want to renegotiate and give the money back and restructure the business to where it's a sustainable business. It's not, you know, bloated with employees, you know, huge yep. marketing budgets. That's also an option. Would you agree with that? Yeah. In, in, in the, the playbook that I usually hand a founder that works pretty effectively, first things first, um, you do not want to go back to your whole board, so to speak, and have this conversation no, as it no, as you, a conversation at a board meeting, right? You talk to way to go. You talk. You, you need it friendly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so let's say you've got a five person board. It's you, your co-founder. You got a board observer and two investors. In, in almost every case, there's one person on the board. Hopefully not two, but one person that's kind of an able, right? It's kind of an able, and so you want to go to that person last, right? You basically want to make sure your co-founder's on board. Again, let's assume this is the, 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 the order of events. You then want to go probably to your board observer because that was probably a friend of yours anyway, and that's how they got the job. You basically want to start to build up um, some understanding. And this is the message that you want to send to them when you do. You don't go with, hey, it'd be kind of interesting if maybe we sold. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. That leaves 
all the room in the world for them to like push back and say, ah, it's not really what you want to do. And you're making it sound like conversation. By the time you're going to have that conversation, it needs to be definitive. Dude, I'm out. I'm out of money. I'm out of like hell. <laughs> like my my spouse is trying to, you know, is is tired of dealing with my shit. Um, I need to get out. Okay, now, now hear me out. Now, need to get out could mean two things. It could mean I need to sell the business or I need to negotiate a new deal. But if you leave it as in, hey, let's just talk about it. It won't go your way because at, at which point the investors think maybe you'll just keep abusing yourself. They'll let you keep abusing yourself, sadly. So you need to be definitive, even with your co-founder and say, look, dude, I'm out. This is it. Uh, th these are the decisions I have to make and be, and be strong about that. People will understand. That's the thing. We build this, this idea up in our head, guys, right? Where it's like, oh my God, no one will understand. And they'll come out with pitchforks. No, they won't. <laughs> just be like, I'm fried, right? Can't do this anymore. People get it. And I think the reason for that is if you're honest and you just say, I'm fried, I need to restructure this so there's some upside for me in the yep. business because that motivates me to keep going and potentially get you a return. The other option is zero. We're basically... Yeah. Because and I think another thing that a lot of founders don't understand is, and I don't, I don't recommend it, but you can quit. You're not legally bound to a company. You can just say... Nobody I, gets so, that. I love your advice in terms of just like, because the person who wins a negotiation is the person who cares the least. Yeah. Uh, maybe not the right quote for this, this conversation, but you, if you're in that situation where you're feeling stuck and you see no upside in the business and you don't even know, like you could, you could start something new and be super excited. But if the business was structured to where you had more upside and, you know, uh, you were able to renegotiate that again, doing it firmly and just telling yep. investors like, this is what I need to keep this business going. Yep. And that also benefits investors too, because you both get aligned on just the reality of the business and really what yep. you're doing, in my opinion. And I'd love your thoughts on this too, Will, is you're really just having a candid conversation about what's really happening. You and, have they're, to. and they're thinking about it too. They're also, guys, w when you and I are laying in bed at three in the morning thinking about this stuff, like staring at the ceiling. Um, that's, what, that's when I wake up. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you, you know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but when, when, you know, when we're terrified about this and, this, and, and you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket and we're staring at the ceiling, um, this is our only deal, right? No, this is the only thing we're working on. If I'm an investor, ideally a good one, this is one of like 30 things I'm working on, right? And while let's, let's say I'm an investor and guys, you come to me and you're like, hey, um, you know, things aren't working out. I'm going to have this conversation like six more times this month with other founders, right? So to me, it's not that mind blowing of a conversation for you as the founder, it's life or death, right? So understand your audience too. Your audience in many cases too understands that these things happen or ideally they should. Um, if investor and not everybody. Else. I agree. So that's door number one yep. is if you're in a situation where you feel like your venture back startup is failing, but again, mm -hmm. you built a great product. You got like you, you, you've done what 99% of, you know, others will never do. And you should be yep. proud of that. Um, that's an option is you can renegotiate your valuation, your ownership. Yep. There's a lot of options there. Um, and what you Maybe. do is you tie, sorry, you guys can say you tie it to milestone. You say, look, um, here's a new deal. Here's where it benefits me. Here's where it incentivizes me, but here's where it will incentivize you long-term. And you have to start with right now, your option is zero. You can't be like, oh, I know we raised at 50 million, but like, you know, this one will only get you five. You'd be like, dude, you invested however much you invested. Sadly, it's gone. We're starting from zero. This is how you recapture from zero, not here's how you make the best of a $50 million investment. That just, it doesn't exist anymore. It, it, it's like, you know, you invested in, in FTX back in the day and you're like, but I put 50 million in. Yeah, it's gone, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter how you felt about it, it's gone. And so um, you have to start even for yourself as the founder with that mentality so that you can build up a new version. Because if you keep trying to base it off on what was, you can't win. There's actually no way to kind of rebuild that that history because that moment in time doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad we touched on on this one. I want to move on to uh, the buckets for I'm I'm just done. I want to get out. Yep. 
Um, but there's a lot of great businesses where the founders, they love, they're passionate about what they're building, but yep. you know, the whiplash, the expectations, they're not meeting them uh, the upside it's gone and you can yep. renegotiate something that aligns everybody where it could be a win-win for you and your investors. I'll give you some examples. So, uh, I, I can't go into the, into the specific details because uh, some of these are under NDA and I never want to tell another founder's story because I don't think it's fair to them. Um, but one of the businesses we bought, I can talk high level. Uh, one of the businesses we bought early on was a, called, a company called Clarity.fm, right? And you're familiar with Clarity. Clarity is a marketplace where it allowed uh, uh, um, experts to be able to connect with people who needed to talk to them and essentially charge for their time, right? Awesome. Uh, the founder of that is a guy named Dan Martell, friend of mine, awesome, awesome entrepreneur. Um, and... Dan got to a point. Let's give Dan a shout out. I love Dan. Yeah, he's awesome. He's awesome. And you know what? The reason I'm using this example was because of how smart Dan. So in other words, like be like Dan in this case. Um, Dan uh, raises a few million dollars. This is like eight years ago, so I'm trying to remember my numbers. But Dan raised like eight million dollars, and he raises from some well-known investors. Dan had like you know good cloud even back then. Um, I remember Mark Cuban was in the deal. There's a bunch of people in the deal that were like pretty well-known folks. And Dan gets to the business where he didn't spend crazy. He, you know, he was very you know mindful with his cash. He had a little bit of cash still left in the bank, and he calls me up and he says, "Hey, uh, you know, I really love what you're doing with startups.com. Um, would love to see if Clarity could be a part of that, right?" And I hadn't thought about it about that, but, but Dan brought it up, which I thought was a really cool move. Um, we sat down, uh, we talked about where he was at and here's what Dan said. And I, I'll never forget this. I thought this was just such a pro move. He said, well, I can keep running this business. I like the business. I, I I'm proud of what we've built. We've got some cash in the bank. We've got revenue, right? But I can't go raise more money on this business because it's not going to be a venture outcome. And I'm not going to take people's money on a story that maybe even if I could sell, that I don't want to stand behind. And I just thought that was such a... And so he had that conversation with his investors. He said, look, I like the business. It's got opportunity, but I don't think it's going to be like the $100 million plus exit. It's not. And so we have to we have to look at the business for what it is now, not what we thought it could be three years ago. And so we ended up doing a, a deal with Dan where he got some stock, he got some cash, and we took over the business. Worked out great for Dan. His investors are now our investors, you know, in our cap table, if you will at startups.com. And if, and when we go sell for a billion dollars, those guys will all get paid. You know nice. what I mean? So did you do a, wins. did you do a stock sale or an asset sale for that business? We, we always do asset purchases. We, we, we never buy the actual operating company. There's never any upside in it. In, in as far as I'm concerned, for those that aren't familiar, there's kind of two ways to buy a company, um, many ways, but two ways that, that people tend to fall on. One is an asset sale where you just buy the assets, think customer list, website, et cetera but you do not own the actual company itself, the C Corp, LLC, whatever it is. That remains as its own entity. So Dan's original company that was uh, Clarity still exists. It still exists as an entity that holds its stock in startups.com. Interesting. So that's how you, you didn't um, form a new corporation and then just move investors into that new corp. You kept the existing corp. Well, we didn't need to because he already had an existing holding structure, right? Or, ah. you know, company structure. And so they could just maintain it. Now, some of the downsides to that um, is that Dan's got to maintain this damn entity. All that me really means is he's got to do a tax filing, you know, on an annual basis. But he does have to maintain the fundamentals of the entity, which isn't much, but it exists, right? Um, and it exists for one reason, to hold its stock in startups.com. At which point we sell, they get their percentage of our sale. And then that gets distributed to everybody in their C corp or whatever they had at the time. Love it. That's a good. The story. other option, just to complete the thought, is you buy the C corp or whatever the, the corporate entity is. The reason you don't want to do that, the reason I never want to do that, is because you're also buying whatever liabilities are tied to that legal end, right? And who knows, right? Who knows what suit you have pending somewhere? Who knows, you know, who's upset in the cap table? At which point you just buy the assets and you're not buying the entity itself there's a much bigger firewall between those kinds of issues. Yeah. So I, I was hoping to explain that, but you did it better than me, Will. <laughs> um, so really the main, the main benefit to doing a stock sale versus an asset sale for the founder is tax purposes. Sure. You'll generally benefit from um, QSBS, Google it if you haven't. Um, yep. If you don't know what that is, it, it basically means you pay a very low um, long-term uh, federal gains tax. So it has um, some tax implications that are very low yep. and very favorable to the owner of the business. But like you said, as a, a buyer of the business, you're you're acquiring potential lawsuits, a third co-founder who pops out of nowhere sues you. Yep. Um, so typically, um, as if if you're if you're looking to sell your business, it probably will be an asset sale. Trust me. Right. All, 
because right. like you said, there's very little upside for a buyer unless your business is ripping and you can command your terms and stuff like that. Yeah. So maybe accept that in your mind if you're listening to this podcast and this is resonating with you. Okay, let's move on to the next bucket. Um, you know, I got um or it sounds like we covered the I got a little bit of cash, things are going okay, but yeah, usually usually not the situation. <laughs> usually by yeah. the time you're here, like um you're starting to think about it when you have a little bit of cash, but by the time it comes to, toward the end, in my experience, there's not really much cash left. Um you you said something earlier. I just, I just want to reiterate what you said because it's so important. You couldn't quit your startup. Just <laughs> You are not an indentured servant, right? Like, yeah. You know, and I, I, I say that because a lot of people don't hear that. Like, they, they actually don't know that that's possible. I, there's so much startup truisms. And I think, you know, I, you know, I'm a big believer in like never giving up. And so that, but that's just like how I'm wired. Yep. But if I if I'm <laughs> wired like that, but again, I'm stressed out, I'm burnt out, um, family problems are coming in, bills are starting to add up. It's okay to quit. It's okay. You're not a failure. You you've still like, done what most people like. I always say you want to say I tried rather than what if. And yep. you know people will still fund you if that's what you want to do. You know second time around. Um, but realize, yeah, quitting is an option. But I, the only thing I would say about quitting is before like don't do because um, with investors they believed in you. You know, they wrote you a check and they 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 put their money where their mouth was. And they said, I think you could build something amazing. Now, the degree of that belief is you know, another discussion. But you, I, in my opinion, you have a fiduciary duty to at least go back to your investors and tell them, hey, like this is where I'm at right now. Like yep. I want to go down one of these doors, um, but you can just walk away. But before you do that, I highly recommend having a candid conversation with your investors that position, maybe it's a raise, maybe it's something small like that, that kind right. of keeps the company alive, keeps you going. Um, but I guess more or less what I'm trying to say is if you're in that situation, have candid conversations with your investors and let them know where you're at. Because yep. there's no point in just wasting years of your life or potentially losing years of your life over just being stressed out all the time or damaging personal relationships in your life because those are the things that really matter at the end of the day. Yeah, let's use a sports analogy as far as where people are typically at, right? And let's say that they're a football player where there are significant injuries, okay? We're not talking about um, walk off the field when somebody said something mean to you, right? And your feelings are hurt. We're not even talking about walking off the field when you think you might have sprained your ankle, right? We're talking about walking off the field when you just got a concussion, right? When you're getting carted off the field and your thought is, oh, maybe I should still be in this game, right? That's usually, the, that's, the, that, that's the point that I'm talking about. At which point Me, yeah. thing is actually dangerous to you, not just because you don't feel like it. And frankly, having met with thousands upon thousands of founders, I have hardly ever met a founder at the end of this that's just like ah i just my feelings were hurt so i had to leave by the time i'm talking to folks or even you know before then they have ruined their lives at so many levels both emotionally financially the relationships etc that they don't even understand that you don't have to do that i didn't understand it and i did all of those things <laughs> I, I pushed everything past uh the point i shouldn't have been i got knocked out 18 times in the same game and i was like oh i should keep playing right it's like no yeah, no, not. Uh, I mean, and, and you can feel it, you know, so if you're there, just understand, you know, there, yeah. there, there's multiple doors, but let's move on um, to the next one. So sure. we're running out of money. Uh, it's it, the writings on the wall. This yep. business isn't. I, I either need to wind down the business, exit the business. Something has to happen because it's just a, a fuse on a bomb. Yep. But hopefully as a founder, you recognize this ahead of time and you don't take it down to four or three weeks because you have employees you got to take care of where yep. you want to make those those I always say, um, you know, also think about your employees before your investors. This might be a little bit co more controversial, but these are people that chose to work with you and spend more time with you than their families believed in your mission. Yep. And I think you have a duty as a founder to take care of them. So yeah, you want to so. make sure that you have some capital in the bank to number one, give them some sort of severance, help them find other jobs. Um, but 
more importantly, be transparent with them. I think one of the worst things I've been seeing lately is, surprise, we have two months of runway left, everybody. And then everybody panics and there's yep. no plan in place. And all your optionality at that point, at 12 months, your optionality is already pretty limited. But when you take it down to two months of runway, it starts to get pretty dire. So, okay, I'm a founder in that situation. What do you think I should do, Will? I'm a, how, much, 12, how much runway is left? Let's, uh, let's go nine, nine months. Okay, well, um, nine months in my mind, you, you have all the time in the world. Now, now when I say that, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the opposite of what you just said. What I'm saying is most startups are only raising for 18 to 24 month runways to begin with. So by the, by the time you've completed your raise cashes in the bank, six months are gone. You've typically only got eight to 12 months worth of cash anyway. Um, in, in, in most funded startups, as far as you know, what your burn rate is, Think, but th things, things are like, there's some situation. I, I got an investor update um, I won't name the company, but, um, m maybe I'd love, I'd love your opinion on this startup. Um, yeah. they're pivoting, uh, basically pre-revenue 12 years of runway in the bank. I mean, that's pretty anomalous, right? Uh, it, it can it happen. Sure. But, but again, we're also only talking about, uh, folks that have like, a big amount of cash in the bank, you know, venture funded startups, which, which as you and I talk about all the time are like 1% of startups anyway. Um, whereas everyone else, you know, if they're bootstrapped or whatever, it, they've got probably the equivalent of two months of MRR uh, in the bank. And, and they're always looking down the barrel of a gun. But what a lot of people also don't understand, particularly with funding, is it costs a lot of money to wind down a company. It's not like you just take the bank account to zero and you see what happens. Like it costs tens of thousands of dollars at the very least in legal fees and in in um, consulting financial fees in order to officially wind down a company. You know what ends up happening in a lot of cases is the founder gets stuck with that bill, right? Because again, they don't understand what happened. The other side of it, guys, is that by the time I've got, let's say nine months left in the bank, um, I'm also thinking I'm gonna raise again, right? It's really hard with that much runway to say that I'm not gonna be able to pull it off because we're so used to working in such incredibly tight cycles. So the reason a lot of people get down to two months and you're right, a lot of them do, is because they thought that they wouldn't get to two months, right? They, they did all the last minute raises. We bought a company um, eight years ago called virtual.com and uh, it, it went out of business like within 24 hours. It was a great, great company. Um, but crazy shit happened. At the 11th hour on a Friday, they were supposed to get um, a wire from their latest round. And I've never seen this happen up till then and since then. The wire got pulled. And they never got the wire. And they had 450 people on staff, right? Wow. Now, they were coming down to the wire. You know, They needed that, that money to, to, to get in the bank so they could start payroll on Monday. And it didn't show up. My point is that happens a lot, you know, where people kind of like take it to the wire because usually you're not working a lot of cash. Tell me about, okay, so, um, so door number one, if you're in a situation where you just feel trapped and there's no upside for you. Go back to your investors. Start with the ones that may have more empathy in terms of your situation. We'll just hear you out and yep. be definitive about because I think a good exercise to doing this is, you know, write down, you know, basically just like this is what I'm going to do. Yep. And give yourself permission to ask investors yep. to renegotiate some sort of deal structure that is a win-win for everybody. So that's door number one. Um, and then we have door number two, which is um, lots of cash on hand, um, just want to sell the business. Um, I believe we touched on that one with um, Clarity. Yep. So that's where you can find buyers for these businesses. But just, again, I think it, a theme that I'm getting here is just being honest with yourself. Yep. Just with you personally, how are you doing? And then also the future upside of the business. Yep. And, and then I think door number three is probably, uh, you know, the most pressing and probably the one we're, we're seeing the most where really there's just not a lot of money left in, you know, the bank account. Investors have already probably, you know, this is going to zero. Um, again, you built a great product. You have, you know, paying customers, you have revenue. Um, but I want to sell the business. What can I do in those like last two months to make it a better opportunity for potential buyers or to increase buyer interest in your opinion? Yeah. So I, I think when you get to that point, and I think we should, we should kind of explode this topic a little bit. Um, there are a lot of businesses that, that raise a few million dollars. They get to like, let's say 30 to 50 K of MRR. Right. Um, and that's as far as they get. Now, I like, guess, think about that. Let's say you and I started acquire.com, right? We raised a few million dollars and the business got to say $50,000 a month of revenue. And we, we, we have like 20 people on staff and, you know, it's, it's definitely not 
um, the kind of business that's going to support, say, 20 people. But we don't have to have 20 people. If we were to reimagine this business and it was just me, you, and a couple of contractors, this would be an incredible business for us, right? The reason I say that, guys, because this actually happens a fair amount where the founders are like, hey, it wasn't a venture. This is Dan Martell's story, right? It wasn't a venture funded business, lo and behold, but it's still a great business. And, and I think, you know, that's that's what I was responding to you on Friday saying, hey, man, I think there's a ton of really good businesses. And I hate it when people say, and you were saying this, hey, it failed. Yeah, that version failed, right? But like you keep saying, statistically, it was going to fail. There's a 99.9 .9 chance as that- soon as, as soon as it's funded, it's- it's a lottery ticket. Correct. But but this is this is I think a, a big difference. And this is part of how you start to think about how you structure it or present it. Um, it doesn't make it a bad business. If you and I build acquire.com, it's doing fifty thousand dollars a month in revenue. And um, and again, we've got we've got a staff that that we could consolidate, but we can continue to run this and make it a great business for the two of us. It's a win. And we can structure a deal that gets us there. Now, it's also a win for someone else. That's why I'm bringing it up. So let's say you and I have this business, but we're burnout guys, right? We just want to go do something else, right? Remember that $50,000 of MRR might be jack shit to some big company, but to a smaller buyer, it's a huge windfall, right? That was me. I was that smaller buyer, right? I was the buyer going in and telling Dan Martell at Clarity, hey, Dan, you know, it's not a huge business, but it's a big business for us, right? If a business were doing $50,000, we might be able to acquire that business and run it for $10,000 and make it a $40,000 a month a month net business. That's an awesome deal for us. And I don't think a lot of founders realize that. They think that their cost structure, their OPEX, everything else is baked into what it's always been. They forget that that asset in the hands of people that don't have that expense base could be a money machine. I completely agree. So this is the, this is the advice I've, I've also been giving to a lot of founders is before you go to market, try and get your startup to profitability. And that's going to come with a lot of hard decisions. Yep. You're going to have to let some staff go. You're going to have to be really honest with your investors. And when you send that investor update saying, hey, you know, like we're letting people go. We're basically going to cut costs until we're profitable. I think once you hit the mark of break even and profitable, that's when your buyer interest just skyrockets. Because Correct. what you've essentially done, you agree with me? Start a yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I've been on so many acquisition calls where I talk to the buyer, like, what do you think of the business? And they just name all these different things that they would do if they bought it. And to me that I'm like, okay, I go back to the founder. I'm like, Hey, you should fix all this stuff. Cause I'm hearing from every single buyer, customer acquisition strategy, just, um, you know, the unit economics aren't good. Yeah. You're spending too much here. If you fix these problems and then come back to market, you're going to have way more buyer interest and probably a better outcome overall yep. for the business. And then that buys you time more importantly, because acquisitions can take, I don't know, years sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, one of the exercises that I always go through with founders and certainly an exercise that we went through when we um, did diligence on, on 100 companies um, is I say, forget where the business came from. If you and I were starting it today, what would it look like? How would we run it? I guarantee we wouldn't have like a VP of this and a VP of that and a VP of this, right? That made sense when we thought we were going to have a venture funded outcome. But if we were starting the business today, what customers wouldn't we go after? What parts of the product would we not care about? What things would we charge for that we used to give away, right? Like, what does a hard reset look like? And I got to tell you, that's often what, what, as the founder, you're going to be selling to the, to the buyer is the new version of what this business could be, not the tired version that you sold, you know, investors on two or three years ago. Yeah. And one thing I, I think that a lot of founders are struggling with is the strategic buyer the the i call them you know the one and maybe like i i always say hey you know before making any changes just shoot out a few emails head of corp dev head of yep. product uh ceo depending on company size and see if they'll at least take a meeting and you'll get to you'll figure out if there's strategic interest pretty quickly. If there's not then that's where i think you should open up the playbook of reaching profitability and turning it into a sustainable business because that's how you're going to actually sell the business in two and it benefits you in two ways number one it buys you the time so those strategic conversations maybe you're going to hold out for them well you're profitable so you're not going anywhere and then you're probably refreshed because you're not burning a bunch of money every month and watching this like hey we could go out of business in like three months right Get that monkey off your back, position the business into a sustainable form to where, trust me, when you're profitable, it's like a, a breath of oxygen. If, if, you're, if growth is flat and right. 
you've kind of lost, you know, um, you, like it's clear that you're not on, you know, the venture track. Right. Um, and there's, again, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think by doing that, instead of just driving it into the ground is such a smart move that founders, you know, should realize is actually sometimes one of the best outcomes they could possibly have because they could save their company and then have maybe a meaningful acquisition, depending on the liquidation preference and all the terms and stuff like that. Which can be renegotiated. Again, a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that you can renegotiate your deal. It's shitty, but it can be done. Um, and when I say it's shitty, I mean, it's a hard conversation to have, not a shitty thing to do. Um, guys, if, if you were a founder looking to sell and I was trying to say to you, how here's how to realistically think about your options, and I kind of touched on this at, at the beginning of this, I, I'd put it in buckets of percentage probability, right? There's a 40% chance that you'll sell to a PE, uh, private equity, because if you're profitable, because those guys are buying all the time. So right? they do. There's very active, right? There's a 10% chance that you'll sell to a strategic for all of the really dumb reasons you think you're going to sell to a strategic. By the way, it's your best option. But here, here's what's going to happen that absolutely isn't going to happen. Not trying to rain on people's parade, but I hear this all the time, and I just want to like help founders not kind of go off the uh, the, the edge of the cliff Wiley Coyote style, right? Um, number one, um, hey, someone's going to really appreciate how much money we put into this product. No one cares. Money's gone. Mm -hmm. right? No one cares, right? Um, second thing, uh, people are going to really want our customer base. It's worth a ton. Is it? Just because you have customers doesn't mean someone else is going to be able to acquire them and execute on them in the same way. It sounds awesome. Way harder to do. I I've acquired over a million startups uh, in all the acquisitions that we did, right? So a million customers. On paper, that should have yielded me orders of magnitude of value, cross-selling products, et cetera. Never happened, right? I mean, parts of it happened a little bit, not nearly what people think it is. So again, it's cool to be able to say, I have all these assets that theoretically might have value, but the buyer has to be willing and able to extract that value from those assets, which is way harder than you think it is. And by the way, you've spent the last five years doing nothing but exactly trying to extract that value. So the last part about that 10% bucket is you're, you're assuming that all the stars align. So you email the corp dev person at name your company. You're assuming that they're looking to buy exactly your type of asset at exactly this time given all the other deals that they may be doing or other opportunities they have. And oh, by the way, you don't make any money, right? Come on, man. Like there's the other calls today for companies that are further along. Why would you think that your company is the one that's going to you know, change all that? I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying like, be a little realistic. That last bucket that makes up the 50%, I don't know this, I'm totally guessing, but I feel like it's it's the heart and soul of the acquire.com customer as far as the buyers, which are people who are buying it for their own purposes, right? Uh, I know when I've used the site in the past, I've seen a ton of those folks on there. Guys, you would actually know the answer, but this isn't specific to acquire. What I'm saying is there are a ton of people out there. And by the way, part of this buying population are the actual founders themselves, right? Of people that are just owner operators that would come in and take over the business. And yeah, it's not making a lot, but they don't need to make a lot. When you go to PE, it has to be a lot because it has to be worth their while. When you go to strategics, it has to be a lot. But if you've got 50K in MRR, there are a lot of people that could just take over that business, former entrepreneurs, et cetera, angel investors, what have you, which tend to be former entrepreneurs. Um, and, and, and part of that, that, that buying population are the founders themselves taking over the business and running it like we talked about before. Agreed. Completely agree. And another thing I would add, and one thing I want to touch on, um, I know we're running long on this. Um, uh, let's let's give this let's give this fifteen more minutes. But I want to yep. talk about um, the opportunities for buyers because when I hear people buying venture back startups, there's such a tone of it's almost like vulture esque. It's like you know we're gonna come in, but. Like there's a group of buyers that I work with on a daily basis that understand these situations and will work with you on structures and how to yep. position the business so you can get approvals from your investors, um, someone like yourself. Yep. Um, but as a buyer, let's say um, individual, you know, private equity has it down, strategics have it down. Yep. Um, but let's say I'm a second time entrepreneur and I'm looking to buy a a really good venture back business. Um, walk me through how you would approach it. I know you've touched on this and it might be a little bit repetitive, yep. um, but maybe maybe pick your favorite bucket of what situation a, a startup is in and walk me through you know, how you would approach that um, and 
really work to get the deal done. Here's the part I don't think people understand, both on the buy and sell side, guys, is most of these companies don't get bought with just a big check cash on the barrel head. You know, I've heard this uh, from from friends of mine who are who are buyers, who are you know founders that may have cashed out, and they're like, hey, I want to look look for you know some deals, but you know, I saw that company raised a, bu a few million dollars. I don't have like ten million dollars to buy it. I'm like. Dude, that's not how people buy businesses at all. I mean, some, yes, but rarely. Here's how most of the deals I see get structured. We pay you over time. It is a combination, one, cash that we pay over time, okay? So that it syncs with any kind of revenue the business itself has. And then some sort of flyer, meaning some sort of uh, equity or sale upside in case the thing goes back on to become wildly successful, okay? So back up. One is, how do we pay for it in cash? The two is, how do we pay for it in stock? The answer is, Typically bolt. Typically, I, I go to the seller and I say, here's how much I can pay you, just using this as an example, on a monthly basis over a period of time, say two to five years, so that you can get your cash back. If you're if this business isn't making any money, I'm not just gonna magically give you a million dollars of cash and just hope that it works out. Why would I do that? It doesn't make any sense, right? But if I say I, I will give you a million dollars over the next three years so I can sink and give myself time to recoup that cash. Awesome. That's a totally different deal. And sellers get that. I think sellers are like, well, don't like we raised $3 million. Don't we have to get $3 million back cash in the barrel head? Absolutely not. That money's gone. Any way you can retrieve that money. And now again, there's two components. One is uh, any kind of cash in the deal and or cash over time. And the second is some sort of equity deal. Here's what I found, guys. When we buy something, if I just come in with a cash offer, then that's all people see. If I come and I say, I want to buy the company, I'm just using small numbers, for a million dollars, right? People are like, oh, I guess that's it. Like, you know, we raised 10, we're selling for a million dollars. But if I say, and you also get this percentage of the upside upon sale, that number can be whatever you'd imagine. That could be $100 million in the future. If you don't keep that variable component, what I call kind of the lottery ticket in the deal, it is very hard to negotiate a cash, cash purchase. Not for everyone, but it's an important part of the, the chemistry. You know that. That's, that's, that's what we're seeing. So, um, my, I'll give you my verbiage on it. So let's say, you know, you look at the business and you value it at 5 million bucks, 10 million yep. bucks. Um, so what you would typically, a structure that could be something that actually works for everybody involved would be 20% cash on close. So that yep. would be, we're buying it for 10 million yep. day of close, you get $2 million and that's probably going to go back to your investors. So Yep. I think, again, going back to our, our previous, um, what we were talking about was, except that you're probably not going to get a lot. And again, yep. that's okay, because it's much better than just watching your startup crash and burn, and then you're stuck with a dissolution bill and all this, like, that's, this could be a great outcome for you. So if, if you're in that situation, and this comes along, um, hear it out. And then, okay, so we got 20%, you know, cash on close, and then maybe, you know, 70% is, or let's do 60% is seller finance. So yep. I'm doing, um, you know, 8 million, that's going to be seller finance, which essentially means I'm going to be making monthly or quarterly or sometimes yearly payments to you. Yep. So every month you'll get some form of cash back. And that's probably going back to your investors as well, depending on your liquidation preference. Yep. And then the last kicker is the equity component, which is you coming in saying, hey, you know, I'm going to take this business off your hands. You've done a great job building it, but you're burnt out. And, yep. you know, I'm going to breathe new energy into this. And this is actually one of my favorite parts about Acquire.com is when, you know, someone is truly at the end of the road and they're able to take what they've built and see it continue to live on, but under the ownership of someone who can breathe in, in, in that energy and also restructure the business so it's a sustainable, profitable business, you bet. which takes a lot of work. It a takes lot a lot of work, work to do this. So you're not going to get the sky high 10x revenue multiples or my least favorite is oh my competitor sold for this amount so i should get that too and you're not selling a house doesn't work that way no yes and but the equity kicker is where things can get really interesting where if you sell to the right buyer um and my advice for founders here is um you know you you, you can never do a good deal with a bad person it's warren buffett quote um so when you sell to something sell your business to someone, make sure it's someone that you really get along with, you really trust them. And you can see yourself, you know, down the line, you know, they call it getting a, a second bite of the apple, right? Those can be amazing deals, because you're solving every problem that I think so many founders are going through, which is burnout, 
no upside. They just want to move on. They feel stuck. And shameless plug for acquire.com. Uh, but we have buyers that can help with that. And then, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say the other part that I tell people all the time, uh, founders, no one will remember whether or not you made money on the sale, but everyone will remember that you sold. That's very true. Okay. So, so if you talk about uh, a resume builder, a, a lot of founders don't think about this at the time, but when you say four years ago, I, I exited my business, people just assume you made money. <laughs> now this isn't a, a, a reason to be disingenuous. What I'm saying is people generally look at the, 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 the sale of a company as a positive. So even if you didn't personally make money, but you're able to, to get the business acquired, that's still an important notch on, on your, uh, on your belt. I call, I call land. I mean, you took a plane up in the air, bird strike hit, yep. you, you know, LaGuardia and the <laughs> airport. I'm using a, a reference from the, uh, when they land the plane in the Hudson river. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, it wasn't pretty. Yep. You know, but they landed the plane. No one got hurt. Yep. That's a much better outcome than, again, just letting the startup completely fail, um, you know, leaving all your employees, investors hanging. So you have optionality, whether you, when you, when you feel like you don't, you really do. And I hope um, this conversation will, this has been awesome. Um, just kind of give some perspective. If you're in these situations, you do have optionality. It's just not talked about very much because all we right. hear about is the winners and, you know, the ones that are getting acquired for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Um, but if you're in a situation where you feel stuck, burnt out, you don't see the upside, you're not motivated, it's hard to get out of bed, it's you know hurting your Every personal relationship, time. that stuff's serious. Yeah, and you is. have options. So um, do you want to end on that note or do you have anything else you'd uh, like to add? One thing I, I, I do want to add because I think it's it's a it's a more positive note, but I also think I, I don't want to uh, overlook this part because I think you even tweeted about it. And we actually just did a, a podcast on this that I think drops today, the startup therapy episode. And it, and it says something to the effect of, the title was something to the effect of, um, there's treasure in failed startups, right? And I, I want to remind people that just because operationally the startup didn't work out doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad asset. To put that in perspective, we've made a 50x return on our investment by buying what other people would call failed startup, right? And it's not even our business model. It's like I'm building a company or something like that, right? It's just that every single time we bought one, it was actually an awesome asset that was Everything you just described, founders were burnt out or wasn't on venture track or just it wasn't trending the way they initially thought. But I looked at that and I was like, OK, this is an awesome product that just has the wrong timing right now. And we're able to take those products and build great companies out of them. So, again, it's not for everybody. It doesn't always work that way. But we've been at this a long time. And I can tell you, um, there's a ton of value in these startups. So, you know, if you're a buyer out there and you're looking at, oh, you know, this, this startup raised some money and it's it's not working anymore. Yeah, it didn't work for that moment. That'd be like dating someone and say, oh, they broke up with the last person. So I guess that person's undateable. Bullshit. <laughs> That's why people get married and divorced again, right? Like um, we found so many good deals out there. And I think on the flip side for the founders that are looking to exit, remember, that, yeah, maybe it didn't work for this moment, but there's definitely a second life to be had. I completely agree. Um, well, you're you're awesome. And I I, I I hope as many founders in this, and, you know, whatever situation you're in, just understand there's always a positive outcome. And I think yep. just, you know, um, understanding them and really un the sooner, the better, because yep. you don't want to get to the the two week line because it makes everything just that much harder. Um, but this, this has been awesome. Well, I appreciate you um, coming on the podcast. If people want to learn um, more about you. Um, where can they find you? I know where to find you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I live over at startups.com, you know, it, as, as you know, I, I was thinking about just, just now, as you're saying this guys, um, startups.com is where everybody goes to start and uh, acquire.com is where everybody goes to, to finish their journey, to sell their company and you know, kind of you and I are kind of bookending this process. Um, but, but I've got a podcast called Startup Therapy where we talk about all of this stuff at Infin, uh, that the personal side of building startups. And uh, and you can find me all over social at, at Will Schroeder, W-I-L-S-C-H-R-O-T-E-R. -E right on. I'll put all that in the show notes. Well, uh, Startup Yoda, always a pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate you, Will. Thanks, brother. Cheers. <laughs>